Saturday the 17th of November 1973, Gitche Manitou State Preserve, Leon County, Iowa. A small nature preserve that lays home to ancient Native American burial mounds in northwestern Iowa that would play host to an event rooted in pure evil. Five teenagers from South Dakota would venture into the nature preserve that Saturday in November to hang out. However, only one of those five would leave Gitche Manitou alive. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this episode, I'd like to thank Dungeons & Dragons for sponsoring this video. Not so long ago, Dungeons & Dragons reached out and asked whether I'd be interested in taking part in a D&D game with a few other creators for their channel. And let me tell you, I jumped at the opportunity. I absolutely love immersing myself in the storytelling and creativity within D&D campaigns. And honestly, the campaign we did was so much fun and full of twists and turns. Now, if you don't know what D&D is, it's a role-playing game that you can play with your friends in person or over the internet using video or voice chats where you embark on a fantasy adventure. As a massive storytelling fan, D&D is in my blood. You journey through a story with your friends, battling enemies, questioning characters, going on quests, and so much more. The possibilities within the game are quite literally just limited by your imagination. During the campaign that I took part in with other creators, which by the way, we fully recorded so you can watch over on D&D's YouTube channel, one of my absolute favorite moments was when my character, Sherlock, and Joel's character, Theodomar, were bickering with one another at the city library. It was just so funny and it literally had me screaming. And without giving too much away, I absolutely loved the ending of the campaign too. The story arc and character development throughout was just so natural and so beautiful. I just couldn't recommend watching the campaign more if you're interested in D&D. Here's a short sneak preview. We have quite an adventure for you today. I've never seen anything like this. Both of you are such excellent hunters. Oh, it's a one. I want to find out more. Am I dead right now? In D&D, you play as a character, mine being called Sherlock, because I was a detective who was also an orc. You like my pun? Eh? Eh? And before you start on a campaign, you use dice to roll different attributes for your character, which are used throughout the campaign. You also get to choose your race and class, and you can customize your abilities, skills, spells, weapons, and so much more. The character sheet is super important and useful when playing D&D, and is one of the core aspects to the game. I know it may seem a bit complex at first glance, though it is truly simple to understand and use. You can see from the character sheet for my character Sherlock Hawthorne that Sherlock is a rogue half-orc with an investigator background. You use dice rolls to determine attributes such as your strength, dexterity, and intelligence. Sherlock's HP is kept track of throughout the campaign here, and I can easily see what armor, weapons, and tools are at my disposal from a quick glance. And the game is forever expanding with new content. If you've never played before, you can grab a beginner's kit like the D&D starter set, or if you just want to launch straight into a campaign, you can grab one of the many pre-written campaign books. It's such an accessible game, more so now than ever before. You can find the character sheet for my character Sherlock in the description down below, and you're more than welcome to use my character in your own D&D games. Be sure to send me a DM on Instagram or tag me on Twitter if you do use Sherlock, I'd love to see it. And of course, you can watch the D&D campaign that I played with other creators over on the D&D YouTube channel. I've also linked this down below for you. Now, back to the case. Sandra Shesky was born in 1960 to her mother Dolores and Cameron. 
She was the youngest of four children born to the couple, with five children being born in quick succession. Though, sadly, the couple lost their second baby boy shortly after birth. And unfortunately, the marriage between Dolores and Cameron wasn't one destined to last. The couple experienced great financial difficulties, which led to numerous arguments between them, causing Cameron to leave Dolores with three boys and one girl. All of her children, due to them being so young, constantly wanted attention from their mother, and as Dolores had become a single mother, she had to work long hours to keep herself afloat. On top of the long working hours, Dolores also decided to go back to school and train to become a nurse in the hopes it would provide a financially more secure future. Though this meant that she had little to no time for looking after her children. And so Dolores's parents offered to look after the kids until she had gone through nursing school. And when Sandra was just 18 months old, she and her brothers moved to live in the care of her grandparents. The children would ultimately end up staying with their grandparents for three and a half years until Sandra would turn four years old. And life growing up on their grandparents' farm wasn't easy, especially as their grandparents were aging and didn't have the same energy and mobility as they once had. It was at her grandparents' farm that Sandra would develop a deep love for animals, and Sandra would leave her grandparents' farm with memories of love and happiness, memories she would reflect on, and memories that would bring her strength in the years to come. By the time that Sandra had started school, her mother had met a new man. And as Sandra's school career progressed, living under the same roof as her brothers, mother and stepdad, things became tense. Her brother, on one occasion, shouted at their stepdad, saying that he hated him and that he wasn't their dad. This fighting became the norm for Sandra's family, and it deeply upset Sandra. This all came to a head when Sandra returned home from school one day to the news that she and her brother Bill were being sent to live with different foster families. Sandra barely caused any issues at home, and such a drastic upheaval of her life caused a lot of pain and confusion. She would later find out from a relative that this was due to a alleged drinking problem that was going on at home, but Sandra knew that she hadn't been underage drinking, and she hadn't had any problems with her stepdad. Sandra presumes that the stepdad simply didn't know how to handle kids, and so sent her and her brother away. Whatever the case, Sandra was rushed into the home of her foster family. But the foster family she had been placed with weren't good people. Sandra broke down on the phone to her mother one night and told her of how her foster parents would beat their own child with a wire coat hanger. As a result of this, Sandra was removed from the foster family's care and was taken to a second foster family. And tragically, this second foster family were cold and uncaring towards her. They never acknowledged that she was there. Sandra felt like an unpaid maid rather than a foster child. Fortunately, after begging her mother to let her come home, Sandra left the care of her second foster family and returned to the family home, though the child-hating stepdad still lived there. Sandra's brother Bill also returned back to the family home, and he'd actually had a good experience being fostered with a police officer's family. Sir, stop wreaking havoc on the set. I apologize if you can hear any noise in the background of this video. My cat is in the filming room at the moment and he has decided to wreak havoc. <laughs> Their stepdad was not pleased in the slightest. And as Sandra and Bill were of Native American descent, he sent them off to a Native American boarding school. The shabby boarding school was located in South Dakota. Sandra and Bill both had pretty bad experiences at this school, with a stern nun on one occasion telling Sandra that she'd never return home. But when the school term ended, Sandra and Bill returned to the family home for the summer. Over that summer, Sandra managed to convince her mother to not send her and Bill back to the boarding school, and it appeared that the fighting within the house had completely calmed down. It was as if a new leaf had been turned. Out of nowhere, Sandra's mother informed her kids that they were moving to a tiny town in South Dakota, a town called T. The children were now all in their teens, bar from Sandra, who was to turn 13 within a few months. And yet another upheaval of their lives, losing friends and changing schools, 
left the children feeling crushed and devastated. By the summer of 1973, the family had settled into a large farmhouse just outside the town of T, South Dakota. It was a short half mile walk into town, a walk that the children took numerous times that summer to find something to do. Sandra soon made friends within the small town, and eventually she went with another girl to the drive-in theatre. The girls didn't stay in the car, they cut out to go socialise with other teens from the town. It was then that Sandra first laid her eyes on a boy who she fell in love with, Roger Essam. Roger was a friend of the girl Sandra had come to the drive through with, and he began talking to Sandra as if they'd known each other for years. Alongside Roger was another boy called Stuart Bade. Roger's best friend. Sandra exchanged phone numbers with the boys and parted ways. When Roger phoned Sandra for the first time, they spoke on the phone for an hour before Roger decided to ask Sandra out on a date. Over the course of the late summer, Roger and Sandra went on many dates and began a relationship together. Roger, who was actually 17 years old, didn't know that Sandra was just 13. Sandra looked a lot older than she was, and she didn't want to ruin their relationship with the truth, so she kept her age to herself. Roger attended the Washington High School in Six Falls, South Dakota. Another one of Roger's friends, Mike Hadrath, also attended the high school and actually lived just half a block away from Roger, so naturally the two spent a lot of time together. Mike was a popular sophomore with a huge talent for athletics and sports. He was in practically every school sports team and was very successful in his sporting career. On Friday the 16th of November 1973, Roger and Mike crossed paths in the hallways at school and decided to make plans for the weekend. They decided to invite a few friends to go with them to hike out to Gitche Manitou State Preserve where they'd just hang out, build a fire, and listen to some music. Roger's friend Stuart Bade, who had been with Roger when he'd first met Sandra, had a driver's license and a van that he could use to drive everyone to the state preserve. The group that they settled on included Roger, Mike, Stuart, and Stu's 14-year-old brother, Dana, and Sandra. In the morning of the 17th of November 1973, Mike kissed his mum goodbye and waited for Stu and his brother Dana to pick him up. Mike's mum watched as Mike left the house to walk to the van, unknowingly forming her last memory of Mike alive. At about 2pm on that Saturday, Roger phoned up Sandra and invited her on the trip to Gitche Manitou, and Sandra said she'd love to go. Roger told her that they would be coming to pick her up in Stu's van, and as Sandra's mother worked late hours, she had a lot of flexibility with what she could do, and so she raced to get herself ready. But by the time 8pm had rolled around and Stu still hadn't picked her up, Sandra started to worry. She began to overthink everything. Did Roger hate her? Had she said something wrong? She cried on the sofa, going over her conversation on the phone over and over again, analysing it. Though, just as it seems she had been ditched, Sandra received a phone call from Stu, who explains that they'd made a few stops to collect some supplies and that there'd be about half an hour. Sandra's worries melted away. She told Stu that her brother Bill had just gotten home and asked whether he could come along with them on the trip, and Stu said sure. And so 30 minutes later, Stu's van pulled into the drive and Sandra and Bill left the family home to get into the van. Though just as Bill was climbing in, one of Bill's friends also pulled into the driveway and told him that he was going to a party and that a hot girl that Bill had a massive crush on was going to be there. Bill looked at Sandra with an expression of, do you mind if I go to this party instead? And Sandra laughed at Bill and told him to go get the girl before closing the van door and setting off on the journey to Gitche Manitou. Roger and Sandra held hands as Stu's van raced down the roads to Gitche Manitou until the van came to an abrupt stop. Sandra glanced out the window of the van and realised that they weren't in Gitche Manitou at all, but were actually back in the town. Stu had forgotten his guitar, which he ran to grab from his house, before finally the group set off in the van for the state preserve. The sun had already dipped below the horizon when they had arrived, with darkness enveloping the state preserve. Wind and wildlife rustled in the bushes as the teenagers climbed out of the van into the nature that surrounded them. Sandra asked the group if there was anyone else in the area, and after a quick scan around, Stu replied by saying that there doesn't seem to be. Stu's 14-year-old brother grabbed some paper from the van to use as a fire starter as Roger tried to locate the best place to have a campfire. 
though the group stumbled upon a recently extinguished campfire and decided to walk further down near the bank of a river so that they wouldn't be disturbed. The November cold began to set in and the need for the warmth of a fire became pressing. The group grabbed dead wood from the surrounding trees and promptly lit a small campfire. They sat around the heat that radiated from the fire, with Sandra leaning against Roger, her romantic fantasies coming true. Dana, Stu's 14-year-old brother, got up to stoke the fire, but suddenly stopped. A noise in the distance caught his attention, Dana's eyes darting to the tree line, scanning for the source of the noise. He asked the others whether they had heard that sound. Dana was a popular eighth grader at a junior high school in Six Falls, and he idolized his older brother, Stu. Stu works hard in trying to become America's next biggest band, and Dana wanted to follow in Stu's footsteps. Stu was constantly teaching Dana new guitar chords, and he gave Dana rides in his van whenever he wanted it. The relationship between the two brothers was strong and unbreakable. They were very, very close. It was about 9.50 p.m. on the 17th of November, 1973, when Dana had heard the strange noise coming from the tree lines, and he hadn't been the only one in the group to hear it. Roger focused immediately on the tree line, and in hushed whispers, he told Stu to stop playing the guitar and for everyone to be quiet for a minute. Sandra heard what sounded like a twig snap nearby, and when she looked at Roger, she knew that he'd heard it too. Was it just an animal in the woods? Was it a human? Sandra's mind began racing. The group fell silent, everyone listening to the sounds of the nature that surrounded them. Another twig snapped, then another. There was definitely something out there. Whatever it was, was getting closer. The group rose to their feet. Could it be a bear? The crackling of the fire filled the silence as they continued to listen, with fear slowly consuming them. After a few more moments, Stu decided to break the tension by playing a few chords on his guitar and the group's fear slowly dissipated as they began to sing along to Stu's guitar playing. The boys began to roll a cigarette and passed it around the group, hoping the nicotine would help to take the edge off. Stu noticed that the campfire was beginning to die down and asked his brother Dana to go with him to grab some more dead wood from the forest that surrounded them. And after a while, Sandra began to realize that Stu and Dana hadn't returned from beyond the tree line. Her worried train of thought was abruptly interrupted by yet another strange sound, causing her to gasp in shock. She turned to Roger and Mike and saw by the expression on their faces that they'd heard it too. Was it just Stu and Dana? Mike called out for Stu and Dana and they shouted back, but from the opposite direction from where the strange noises were coming from. More twigs snapped, the sound getting closer and closer. And all of a sudden, Stu and Dana burst from the dark tree line with empty hands. The group could all sense something was wrong, but they could not have possibly realized the gravity of the danger they were in. Two men running through the shadows caught Sandra and Roger's eyes. There was someone out there watching. Roger called out to them. Maybe the place they had been in had been their former campsite. Maybe they just wanted to come back to the campsite and found them, this group of teenagers there. Maybe they had set up camp in the wrong spots. Their minds were racing, but the mystery men, they gave no reply to Roger's calls and the sound of twigs snapping stopped. Maybe they'd left. The fire dwindled as the group once again stood in fear. Noticing this, the group of five decided that they really needed to find more deadwood to keep the fire going so that they could continue their evening. And so Roger and Sandra walked off towards the tree line. Though, as they left the safety of the campfire's light, Sandra and Roger saw movement from within the darkness of the trees. Roger yelled into the cold air that rushed between the trees and the forest, who are you? What do you want? And once again, Roger's calls were met with silence, and then the sound of crumpling leaves. And suddenly, two men emerged from the forest and ran to a large rock some 20 feet from Roger and Sandra, followed closely by another dark figure. Sandra was able to get a better look at the figures and her stomach dropped with fear when she realized what they were carrying, guns. Two shots suddenly rang out across the campsite, echoing through the surrounding forest and the group scattered. Mike dragged Sandra to a sheer drop, a drop that was just off at the river's edge and told her to shield herself behind a tree there. The fear of death froze Sandra she wasn't sure where Roger went. She only knew that Mike was the only thing between her and these mysterious attackers. Everything had happened so quickly. One minute they, she was standing with Roger, then there was a gunshot, another gunshot, 
and Mike had dragged her behind this tree. It all happened so quickly she hadn't had time to process it. Sandra peered into the campsite, tears streaming down her face, and she saw Roger flinch as another gunshot rung out across the campsite. She saw Roger collapse to the ground, like a bag of sand falling to the floor. And Sandra knew instantly that Roger had been hit. Another shot was fired, hitting Stu directly. Stu fell to the floor in agonising pain. His brother Dana called out to him, trying to comfort his older sibling. Stu's moans of pain filled the cold November air. The only sounds that Sandra could hear, it was as if the entire forest had fallen silent, holding its breath with just as much fear as that which filled Sandra. Sandra pressed herself tightly to the tree, imagining herself as becoming one with the tree, and began praying that the men would go away, for it to stop, for the nightmare to end. The three men turned their attention to the tree that Sandra was hiding behind with Mike, and focused their guns on the pair. And then silence. Silence that seemed to go on for years, with each heartbeat feeling like an eternity passing. It was about 11pm when the silence was broken by a voice calling out, quite, We're with the police. Come out with your hands up, but nobody dared to move. The only sounds coming from Stu moaning in pain. The voices called out again, quote, We're with the police. Come out with your hands up. Mike whispered to Sandra, telling her that those cops had already shot at them and telling her not to run. Sandra and Mike rose their hands and emerged from behind the tree that they had shielded themselves with. Mike called out to the cops, telling them that there were two of them, pleading for them not to shoot them. He then asked, quote, who the hell do you think you are shooting at us? One of the three men trains their gun on Mike, seemingly angered at his question, and without saying a word, he pressed the trigger. The force of the hit threw Mike backwards and onto the ground, and in fear, Sandra dropped to the ground too, though she hadn't been hit, her instinct telling her to lie down next to Mike as if she'd been injured. The three men then advanced towards the campsites, with one going over to Roger. Sandra prayed that they'd think that they were all dead and leave, or if it really were the police, they'd call an ambulance. Though Sandra had a deep feeling that these three men were lying, that they weren't with the police at all. After a short while, the three men approached Mike and Sandra. The pair laid on the ground as still as possible, believing any movement could result in another gunshot. One of the men walked up to Mike and kicked him hard in the lower back, causing Mike to clutch his injured shoulder. Sandra flinched as one of the men shouted that she was playing dead, before demanding they both stand up. The pain Mike must have been enduring as he rose to his feet after receiving a gunshot wound is impossible to imagine. And in spite of this pain, Mike did stand up with Sandra by his side. At some point, the men had retrieved Dana and brought him to where Mike and Sandra were, and he was stood there with his hands up in the air too. Are they going to put us in the back of a police car now? Sandra thought. But at some deep level, she knew that they weren't going to. Quote, let's take them this way, boss, one of the men said. This is a drug raid. Don't make any sudden movements. Do exactly as you're told. The man who Sandra presumed to be the boss demanded while he trained his gun on them. They ordered Dana to stand next to Sandra and Mike and then motioned for them to turn around. The boss then pointed to a small dirt path that led deep into the woods and told the three teenagers to follow that trail, though the actual trail was in the other direction. The three began walking down the dirt path, guns trained on them from behind, until they came to a ledge that overlooked the Big Six River. The boss then quietly spoke with the other men before telling the three teens to continue on down the dirt path. After a while of walking, Mike asked the men whether they could put their hands down, and the three men agreed. Mike walked next to Sandra and asked her whether she could help him walk. She wrapped her arms around his waist to help support him as the three teens continued down the dirt path with the three gun-yielding men behind them. Eventually, Mike fell to his knees and began to lay down, the pain of his injuries overcoming him. Mike told Sandra that he couldn't feel or move his arm, and she noticed Mike's uneven gasps for air. The boss shouted at them to get up and keep walking, and so Mike rose once again to his feet with the help of Sandra and Dana, and the walk continued. At one point, the boss asked them for their names, and they told him one by one. They continued down the dirt trail until two beams of light pierced through the tree line, the headlights of a car. The lights grew brighter and brighter as the car approached. It was a pickup. The pickup came to a stop in front of them, and another man stepped out from behind the wheel. 
Mike begged them to let him sit down, but they shouted at him, telling him that he will stand or they would blow his head off. Mike then asked if the ambulance was on the way, and the boss said yeah, before asking them for their names, ages, and identification. Only Dana had identification on him, which the men grabbed from him, before asking how many girls there were with them. All of them looked at Sandra, and her stomach flipped. One of the men then ordered the three teens to sit in a tight circle on the ground. The boss rummaged around within the pickup truck for a short while before emerging with a roll of thin grey wire, which he said they'd use instead of handcuffs. He explained with a look of pleasure that the grey wire would cut the hell out of their hands. The men first tied up Sandra's hands with the wire, cutting into her skin. They ordered Sandra to get into the pickup truck, but quickly realised that the makeshift handcuffs were preventing her from being able to lift herself up into the vehicle. So one of the men picked her up and literally threw her in. Once Sandra was in the truck, one of the men told her that they were going to try and get her off the hook and out of there before the sheriff arrives. And when Sandra asked them to remove the wire handcuffs, they agreed. It's important to note that these men were still posing as police officers throughout this, and they kind of kept up this fantasy role play that they were cops. Sandra scanned the inside of the vehicle and saw nothing to indicate that the men were working for the police force at all. No badges, no normal handcuffs. Something wasn't adding up. She then asked the men about Roger. Is he all right? They told him that he'll be fine and that he was only hit with a tranquilizer gun before slamming the door to the pickup closed. Sandra was now separated from Donna and Mike and that glimmer of safety that they had provided her had been shattered. After a short while, the boss climbed into the driver's seat of the pickup truck and began to drive her down the dirt road away from Dana and Mike. When she glanced back behind them, she saw Dana, Mike and Stu being forced at gunpoint to walk down the road by the other men. One of the men had gone back to the campsite and ordered Stu to get to his feet and walk down to where they were. Sandra locked eyes with Dana as the truck left the nature preserve. And then they were gone. The men that had stayed with the teenagers ordered them to stop walking, and after a while, Stu's van drove up towards them, with one of the men behind the wheel. The men climbed into the van and had a brief conversation before departing it, shotguns trained on the teens. Without a second thought, one of the men aimed at 14-year-old Dana and fired. The shot tore through his body, throwing him to the ground. Before Stu could react to the attack on his younger brother, two more shots rang out. Both shots hit Stu, throwing him to the ground too. Mike was the only one left standing, and the men's attention quickly turned towards him. The star athlete of his school, a teenager with so much potential, would never compete again. A shot rang out, hitting Mike. Dana, Stu, and Mike lay motionless, murdered. The men climbed into Stu's van and took off. The boss continued to drive Sandra around for a while before stopping for gas and being joined by the other two men. Eventually, they came to a stop at a farmhouse where they stayed for a few hours before the boss decided that Sandra was too young to get busted and took her home. It is important to note, um, and I'm not going to go into heavy detail here, that at some point when Sandra was in the was being kidnapped by these three men, she was raped. When Sandra was dropped off, Sandra raced into her house and slammed the door behind her. She raced into her brother Bob's bedroom and woke him up, telling him the entire story. Bob told her that they had to call the police because whoever those men were weren't cops. But Sandra was scared that they now knew where she lived, and if they were real cops, then that could be a death sentence. Bob told Sandra to sleep on it, and so she went to bed and tried to sleep. When she awoke at 9am, Sandra raced to the telephone and began ringing Roger's house, but nobody answered. Eventually somebody picked up the phone, Roger's mother, who told Sandra that Roger hadn't come home. Sandra then spoke to one of Roger's brothers and began to tell him about what had happened the night before. What Sandra didn't know already was that Roger's family had already been told by the police that he had been found dead, and Roger's brother asked Sandra whether he could come pick her up. Roger's brother took Sandra to the police station to speak to a detective. The police interviewed Sandra, taking statements, and quickly formed a unit to investigate what had happened. The bodies of Stu, Roger, Mike and Dana were recovered and taken for autopsies. Roger Essam, who was 17 years old when he was murdered, had sustained multiple wounds to the head, face, upper chest and arms. He had seven exit wounds, skull fractures and damage to his brain. Stuart Bade, who had been 18 years old when he was murdered, had sustained wounds to the chest, abdomen and right upper leg. 
He had extensive wounds to his left hand and a large gaping wound in the middle of his back. Mike Hadriff had been 15 years old when he had been murdered. He had sustained wounds to the upper left chest, left upper arm, left side of his face, left hand and his wrist. He had further sustained shots to his back, buttocks and legs. It was determined that some of the wounds had been sustained as Mike lay face down on the ground. Dana Bade, who had been 14 years old when he was murdered, had sustained wounds to the right chest, heart and back. The police took Sandra with them on a stakeout of this farmhouse that the men had taken Sandra to when this had all happened. Sandra had been sure to remember the route there and she waited with the police for any movement. And after what seemed like hours, a man emerged from the house that caused Sandra to scream. Alan Fryer, who was 29 years old, was arrested on suspicion of murder. Sandra identified him as being the boss. Alan Fryer initially denied having any knowledge of the murders, but eventually admitted that he had been hunting pheasants that day in the state preserve. Alan's brothers, David Fryer and James Fryer, were also brought into custody in connection to the case. And eventually, all the men began to point their fingers at one another. Now, it is important to note that Sandra's accounts of seeing more than three men are difficult to establish within the official timeline. It is suggested that one of the three men left the group to go get the pickup when the teenagers were forced to walk down the dirt path, but we don't know. Eventually, the three brothers implicated one another in the shooting and murder of the four teenage boys. They told the authorities that they had been hunting deer on the night that the murders took place, and when they came across the youths and their campfire, for some unknown reason, they pretended to be narcotics officers. It is likely the cigarettes that the group had shared to ease the tension has been what they thought was marijuana, which they then justified the attack on them. Their motive for the murders is confusing and obscure. They acted in a way as to give a stance that they were narcotic officers getting rid of marijuana users, even though none of the teenagers had marijuana at the time. They just decided to kill them. I also must heavily point out that possession of marijuana and the usage of marijuana at the time does not mean you get shot and murdered, does not justify that. You know, there is no justification for murdering somebody you should be brought in for, you know, be arrested, brought in for questioning, trial, you know, the usual justice process, not just a murder. It's such a strange motive, and I personally believe that they were truly evil, and they just wanted to shoot something other than deer. Ultimately, David Fryer pled guilty to the charge of murder, but ended up actually being found guilty of first-degree murder, which is something that he tried to appeal but failed. David Fryer was sentenced to life behind bars on the 27th of February 1974. James Ray Fryer on the 11th of December 1974 was found guilty of the manslaughter of Roger Essam and of first degree murder of Mike, Stu and Dana. He too tried to appeal the sentence but failed. He was sentenced to life behind bars without the possibility of parole. And finally, Alan Fryer was found guilty for four counts of first-degree murder on the 11th of August 1974, and he too tried to appeal his conviction, but failed. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. All three brothers remain behind bars to this day. Now, this case has relied heavily on the first-person accounts presented by Sandra in the book Gitchy Girl by Phil Hammond and Sandy Hammond. You can find a link in the description. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video, just like this one. And if you have a case that you want me to cover on this channel, then head on over to requestacase.com and send in your case submissions there. With all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. If you or someone you know has been affected by issues covered in our programming, including this episode, then please use the link in the description for information, advice, and support.